So, hello, my name is Alexander Granin and today I'll be talking about hierarchical free monads and software design and functional programming. Actually not in functional programming in the world, but maybe in Haskell. Mm. Do you agree with me that Haskell is the best programming language? Who is agree? <laughs> okay, a half of the room. Okay, I guess it's okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what we will be talking about? Firstly, I'll describe what is the state of software design discipline in Haskell. I'll present you some model uh, of how it was been developed uh, for, for time, uh, for decades maybe. And after that, we will discuss some design principles, whether we need them, and maybe how we can do our functional programming in Haskell more popular, and how it can be applied to industrial work. After that, we will go directly to the hierarchical free monads idea. And let, we'll see whether it's helpful, whether it's good, or maybe we can do something else. So let me introduce myself. I'm a, a Haskell developer for not that much, two, three years maybe. Uh, I uh, used to be a C++ developer for many years. And actually I am giving talks about functional programming in C++. I'm uh, driving some ideas from Haskell and uh, porting them into C++. And it's very interesting because C++ has its own way to functional programming. But probably my biggest interest is uh, functional design and architecture and I'm writing a book. And all the ideas I'm describing here are also described in that book. So uh, it's online, it's uh, published, uh, it's incomplete, I'm still working on it, but you can probably read it if, if you wish. Okay, so what is the state of Haskell uh, uh, in terms of software design? Yeah, I think we have a situation when the software design is underrated in our community, meaning that, okay, we have some concepts, we can combine these concepts and we are fine. We are building our applications, nothing, we, yeah, we build our applications, nothing can stop us from using monads, applicatives, functors. Uh, is it really a software design? Let's start from the beginning, from the Big Bang when uh, Haskell was born. And on that time we could not do any I.O. Uh, so we have a black square here. No I.O., no interaction with the other world. Okay, that was a babyhood. And then a childhood came. We now can do I.O. We realized that we can even separate our business logic that can be pure in some sense from the real world in which we interact with, with databases, with file system and other stuff. So we have uh, two layers on this childhood stage, on this childhood phrase, phase. And okay, we think it's okay to divide our application into pure and pure layers, but is it enough? We started thinking about it and it came to the situation when we realized then that we need more effects to be described in our monads. And we created monad stacks, we uh, invented monad transformers, and now we can compose, in some sense, different effects, like you see here, we can compose um, state effect, like storing and getting values from our context, and IO effect, like interacting with the our, uh, outer world. Still, we realized it's not enough to to obey some requirements the software uh, should obey, like uh, stability maybe, simplicity maybe, and maintainability, because when you have a pure, uh, when, you doesn't, does, when you don't have a pure world, when all the things are in the I.O., like here, maybe not directly in the I.O., but in the uh, state T environment, you can do everything. It's not really easy to understand 
uh, is your code reliable? Is it testable? So next step will be to separate these effects from our IO logic and uh, to declare some interfaces to these effects. And the, we ended up with the service handle pattern or service pattern or maybe handle pattern as you wish. Uh, we can define some interface to a subsystem. In here it's logger subsystem. And we can place this interface into a handle. And then we can pass this handle uh, across our logic. Once we need some login possibilities, we go to the handle, we call this logger. We don't know what the logger does. It can write to file system. It can um, uh, push a log to a log server, whatever. Uh, because we just have its interface in form of type. And okay, still we have our logic in the IO. Then we um, went further and we created an idea of reader T pattern. When we have the same uh, handle, but we can write it and put this handle into an environment of reader T. Why, not, why we should pass a handle by our hands? We can just wrap it and let it be in our in, uh, reader T environment, okay? It was a boyhood because still we are dealing with EO. And it's not really convenient for some cases. And Haskellers um, started thinking about how to specify our uh, effects in some other way to, to control them better, maybe to describe them better and to clearly understand what, where we have such effects, where we can do an these effects and these tools should not interact. These tools should be distinct. You cannot uh, do any effects any, anywhere. And this is how the story with effect system started. Okay, we have a ridiculous situation. We have 10 maybe libraries for effect systems in Haskell. And probably before we consider some of them, Let's talk about final tagless and MTL style. In here we should define an interface to our subsystem in form of type class, Haskell type class. Or, okay, logger, maybe random, maybe something else like database. Then in the business logic, we need to compose these uh, type classes in form of constraints. We place them into a list of constraints like here, logger and random. And then we have an M, an M monad in which we can do all these effects. Okay, this is the most spread way to define effects in Haskell world nowadays. Interesting that PureScript tried to implement own effect system in a own manner like a using records on the type level. You have to define several uh, effects uh, as lists of this kind. And then you can only mm, compose these functions uh, because, you know, effect in a pure script effect system is built using open records and the E here can contain any effect. You can compose some functions with these effects, it's okay, except it doesn't work properly. Because uh, when you write a lot of business logic, you have to consider, you have to track your uh, effects here and there, and the uh, pure script system can occasionally say that it doesn't work, you duplicated your effect, or you lacks of some effect, or even this effect uh, is not Pointing to that effect, like this effect uh, contradicts to that effect. And writing business logic with this system was not really a pleasant experience. And hopefully, uh, fortunately, they removed this system from the next versions. Okay. So I, I think it was uh, not a good, that good invention, actually. What about Haskell libraries for effects? As I said, we have a lot of them 
in our ecosystem. Some of them are based used on the free monads. Some of them are made using type level magic. Uh, but the idea is always the same. You need to define an interface to your effect, like file system and methods to work with it. After that, you have a possibility to combine these effects into a type level lists, like here. It's a type level list containing one effect currently. Still, you can add more. And when you write your business logic, you have to check your effects again. So this was a free simple. Extensible effects looks pretty much the same, yeah, except the effect list can be described like this. Or you have another possibility to use MTL style and uh, describing the effects in form of constraints. And for your effects, again, you need to define an interface. You have some way to com compose these effects. Uh, I don't show here how to run these effects against a real environment, because we probably don't need those details. And for your library, uh, I had uh, experience with this library in production. We we're writing a lot of business logic regarding um, invoices, uh, some uh, other stuff from the mine. And uh, it seems like uh, when you miss some effect or we, when you place it in one wrong order, in a wrong order, uh, you will get a very complicated type error from compiler. And it's really hard to understand what's happening. Because, uh, because you need to uh, firstly check your uh, business logic whether you missed some effect, and then you need to understand what the order is, and then you can realize that other functions that depend on this your wrongly written function should be updated as well, and the changes are propagating uh, all the way down to the call stack. And that's a huge obstacle for refactoring, to my opinion. Okay. You can be disagree. You can love this uh, cool type level stuff. I understand this. Still, uh, we probably need to talk about what makes it difficult to use. Okay, one more effect about polysemy. A very recent invention and capability, um, I don't have samples. Sorry, it was very tedious to uh, write these samples into slides. In my opinion, uh, this all stuff, okay, it's cool, yes. It's cool because you want to define all the cases, you want, you want to understand what exactly every function does, still, uh, defining uh, all the cases is not uh, what, how the real world works. Because um, in math, you have to consider all the cases. Other, otherwise, you will end up with wrong theories, with uh, something that is broken. Uh, but a real world requires from us uh, as a developers to do some hacks in our code uh, sometimes. Yeah? We deal with uh, the um, requirements that are not quite uh, defined, they, are, they can be regular. And uh, all this uh, uh, um, stuff, we cannot encode it incomplete. And to my opinion, it's um, an intention to uh, have all the stuff uh, uh, described in types is not really a good way to, to build software because, because it, makes it difficult to develop your applications in a proper way. Yeah. So yeah, uh, this is my uh, thinking about how we can um, consider our math approaches that we need to uh, understand that it's not an answer. It, it, it is an answer for many cases for sure, but not an answer for all the cases. We still need to uh, have a possibility to uh, use a simpler approaches. 
And what are the options we have? We'll see in further. And to my opinion, the only way to get the Haskell community and the Haskell as a language into a real world, into, and to give it more popularity, to uh, have an interest from the industry is um, to provide the, the tenants, those, to those industries a way to build applications uh, and do not bother about all this cool stuff. When you have a framework, you can use all the possibilities out of the box and you do not to invent a particular ways to solve a particular problems. Because in, in, if you will be solving uh, the problems again and again with uh, cool stuff, with uh, particular approaches like uh, type level magic, you cannot really move fast. You cannot really uh, solve all the problems, uh, meaning that you need uh, constantly invent something, which is not really uh, how the industry works. Uh, industry works in such a way that you take ready solutions and you write business logic and it's okay. And, and, and you get money. You probably, yeah, you can disagree with me for sure. Still, I think we need more frameworks and we need more uh, considering uh, respect from uh, Haskell community uh, towards the frameworks and framework uh, writers, I guess. And what, the, uh, what can be the last phase of the, our development in, in Haskell? It, it could be dependent types, except I'm not sure whether we will be writing our code because uh, using dependent types because, you know, to understand dependent types, you probably need to understand what is written here. Okay, it, this scares me a, lit, a little, maybe not a little. And I'm not sure how it will be, how it will, will look like in the code. If it gives, if it will give a real advantage, okay. Seems it not likely to be happen because uh, type level stuff in Haskell, very complicated. Okay, let's move to the next part. I am constantly hearing from uh, Haskell developers, why do we need all these principles? Is it for OP developers? We have math and we okay. Why should we bother at all? Well, I think we should because design principles are not about the uh, concepts we use in Haskell, but rather in the way we structure our applications. You can have a lot of concepts, still uh, composing them and uh, uh, reading the code and uh, provide a clear idea what the code does. It's not only about uh, finding essential properties of this code, like monads or applicative, applicative but uh, also, it's about how we compose um, it in a higher level. So design principles help us to achieve that. And first uh, design principle I want to talk about is inversion of control. It's a well-known principle from a mainstream development. And why we need it? Because it helps to reduce complexity. We as software designers, we as architectures, architects, we are not writing the code. We, we, we are making our code less complex. We work with complexity. There are two types, so essential and accidental. We should both are about reducing accidental complexity. Okay, we also need to separate our concerns because we need to work on the parts of the application differently, uh, separately, independently, and we want to have our business logic testable, maintainable, and all other buzzwords, you know. How we can do it? There are several approaches to do it. Final tagless. Yes, this is a, an approach to inversion of control. It has own 
benefits, it has its own advantages, and it has its own flaws. Free monad approach is another way to do it. And maybe service pen pattern, and reader T pattern. Uh, you are, as a software designer, you are free to choose any solution, but you need to understand how much complexity each solution brings into your code. And when we can do this? Uh, for sure, we cannot build uh, big applications without design principles. We can, but we will throw these applications after a while because they are not maintainable completely. Uh, when we have complex domain with different subsystems interacting with each other, when, when we have long life cycle of our subsystems, uh, this all makes us th think about how we can define subsystems in terms of interfaces, how we can implement them in terms of some mechanism, and, and what, uh, this is what we are talking about constantly in our functional design books, uh, in our design books. And we probably need to talk about it in our Haskell community more. What about solid principles? Are the solid principles only applicable to OOP? Even uh, Robert Martin says, says they are applicable to any paradigm because they are paradigm agnostic. We want to have our code simple, right? Simplicity, simplicity matters. We want uh, our code to be um, somewhat extensible in some forms. We want to have different parts. And so he says, Functional programmers want to separate their code to avoid cross-talks between responsibilities and the users. Okay. They want to minimize the number of modules affected by change. That's also a value. They want to establish a conform to reliable interfaces contracts. Okay. Yes, we need interface contracts. They want to avoid hanging dependencies on modules and resources they don't need. Seems true. And they certainly want high-level policy to be independent on low-level details. This one uh, last sentence says that we need to abstract from our details. Our business logic should not depend on such details so that are not really matter in our business logic. They make our business logic polluted, very fragile, and less readable. So how we can abstract things? There are different approaches, and one of them is uh, to layer your application in certain ways. For example, um, we can talk about uh, onion architecture, or maybe three-layered cake um, as well. They all, uh, these all two approaches are, uh, some, have some in common. You have interfaces to subsystems, you have business logic that is aimed only to use these interfaces, and you have implementation can be impure, should be impure, and these three layers are independent. Actually, it's nothing new for uh, mainstream developers. It might be something new for Haskell developers because we, you know, we don't really want to read what's happening in mainstream. Still, it's nothing new. Okay, let's probably uh, go to the next theme and consider hierarchical free monads as a solution to all these problems. Okay? All? Do you agree? Is it okay? Is it okay? So, what exactly I'm proposing? This approach is used in practice. In, in JustPay, for example. Not only, but in JustPay in particular. We built several frameworks based on hierarch hierarchical free monads. And this approach allowed us to um, write a lot of business logic separately from the impure world. After that, we realized we can easily test it. We can even test it automatically because, uh, because of so-called system automatic irrigation system. And we realized that we can even uh, put some uh, developers 
who is not familiar with Haskell or PureScript, and they will be fine writing business logic using this framework. Because the framework uh, states you should easily write your business logic. You should not buffer about type level magic. Why? Why should you? You need to focus on your domain, not on the cool stuff. Because only business logic has real value. Nothing else. Uh, in this talk, how, many, how much time I have? Okay. In this talk, I'll present you uh, an open source project that is called Hydra. Hydra. Uh, I built this project for my book, and it has comparison between free monads, final tagless, and church coded free monads. You can find uh, several applications built using those three, three approaches. And you can compare how they, how they look like, how they behave, how, what is the performance. So it's a kind of showcase. The application we will be building is about uh, tracking meters, like those meters which fall into, which, is fall, which are falling to the uh, earth, to earth, and we need to take them because uh, it's a some, what, some kind of danger for us. So astronomers do this kind of stuff in their work, okay? The application will be simple. We have some domain model in which we define our um, stuff we, that is important to us, like meter, coordinates maybe, maybe some properties of this uh, meter, and it, it will be a part of our uh, application. We can also want, we might want to store our data into the DB, so we have to define some way to map our domain logic to DB logic, in this particular case, I'll be using Beam. It's a library for uh, abstracting over the different databases. And okay, you probably don't need to get into the details of what's happening there. Still, I want to show you how different parts uh, should be um, organized in terms of layering, okay? For example, we can define a meter table and we can define extra DB with some tables inside. And what about business logic itself? Using these types, we can uh, write some logic in the app L monad. This app L monad is a free monad from the framework. It provides several possibilities out of the box. What possibilities? For example, working with databases. In here, I can uh, call uh, a scenario function that will uh, get that should get a run DB function, which is a, f a function from an, another free monad language like Langale. And then I can pass, for example, Beam there. There are different ways to organize this hierarchy. In this particular way, I have at least three layers of free monadic languages, like AppL uses the possibilities of LangL, which uses the possibilities of SQLDBL, and the Beam itself, the Beam library itself, is built using church code free monads. So we can consider it's another level of abstraction here. Okay, what, what can we else do with our business logic? For example, we can lock something. Yeah, we, we need to lock something. App L uh, language provides you some possibilities to lock this. Do you see something about implementation? What logger, I, I, what logger will be called here? Who knows? It can be a library like Colloc, it can be Katib, it can be HS logger, it can be tiny logger, it can be even just a simple path 
sterling. We don't bother here. We can uh, only, um, we will specify this real logger when we run this logic against real environment. Because we need to focus on the interfaces, not on the implementation. And running this scenario uh, requires some additional bits, like uh, runtime, in which I want to store uh, my operational data uh, that should not be visible for business logic, that should be um, somehow hidden. It's a implementation detail. I don't bother it about it in my business logic. I, I can create this runtime and can run our, my app L here within this runtime. There is possibility to use different runtimes because uh, what you, all you need is to write uh, some interpreter for this free monad language. And let me uh, shortly describe uh, the top concepts of this free monadic approach. Firstly, you need to define an effect. This is similar to the effect systems, except it's uh, just a um, type that you won't be composing in sense of type level lists. It will be a type that provides you the possibilities out of the box. Okay, I defined this, uh, the two, only the two methods here, like eval length and in init SQL DB. There are many other methods in this app L language. Still, it's enough for demonstration. Yeah? It looks like GIDTs, but it's not necessarily. Yeah, the JDT syntax um, a bit simpler to me to define these methods. But yeah, it can be, actually. Okay, another free monad language, and here we can see the nesting. Because this free monad language, like logger, is nested into another free monad language, like langel. On the previous slide, you can see that we call, we call, we call here another nested language. So you are free from uh, composing these effects on the type level. They are composed for you out of the box. And what about the real stuff that should happen when you run your business logic? You have, you need to define interpreters that will be connecting your methods to real environment, like uh, a log method to real logger facilities. And here, uh, the main idea is that Interpreters for free monad languages can repeat the same hierarchical structure as the languages themselves. For example, we have a nested free monadic interpreter for Langale, and then we can uh, define the interpreter for Logger, and uh, we nest these in interpreters uh, inside others, and we have uh, all those possibilities that we need, we cannot, we should not uh, think how to compose functors, for example, yeah? We, we don't need to think how these uh, interpreters are built, how to connect our um, effects together, like uh, in type level lists or whatever. So, yeah, the, the idea is simple, okay? Are you following this idea? Okay. And probably the last thing I want to show you is that how to, uh, how to use this free monadic approach within a, a real application. Let's define uh, an API for HTTP server to deal with astro, uh, astro events like uh, meteors, like uh, maybe other stuff from the Astro field. We have two methods here. 
for our servant based application and then we need to define an environment for this servant uh, server like environment. Uh, this environment will be an impure environment and we put our application runtime to that environment uh, when we get a call from the outside we can take this environment from the uh, servant and type like from the reader to environment you, you see this uh, pattern is used here and we call our business logic from this handler like meteors and so one layer of our business logic is like free monadic languages. Another layer of our application is like uh, servant handlers. Uh, another layer of our application is real uh, runtime run and the real interpreters. And thus we made a layered application in which all the parts are separated from each other. Okay, let's conclude something what we learned. We have a, a significantly reduced complexity here because when you write business logic, it's very simple. It doesn't require you to know type level stuff like type families or type lists or whatever we have. Complex um, type classes like type classes which have many arguments and maybe functional dependencies. You don't need to know about this. Just focus on your business logic. Simplicity. The code looks simpler. The code looks simpler and uh, it's simpler to refactor it because uh, you don't need to mangle with effects. The application is layered. Uh, one Concern regarding uh, FX systems is that we have all the layers mixed together. Like you, when you wor work in the um, MTL style, in, in the final tagless style, the monad you express contains a bits from your business logic, a bits from uh, uh, real runtime. And when you need to define something that is the, does not fit in this system, you have to hack this somehow. And this is not about layering actually. It's convenient to use. There is no magic inside all the values, all the scenarios, all the interpreters mm, are just some values. You can just pick them up and compose them in a, in a usual functional way. They are values. There is a little bullet on the interpreter in the interpreters and on the uh, layer of free monadic languages, languages themselves. Okay, we can deal with it because uh, the boilerplate on that side is not uh, that critical. We write it once and after that we don't need to touch it. And we write business logic more often than we change our framework. Performance. Uh, sometimes uh, Haskellers complain about performance of free monads because, you know, uh, composing them, them internally looks like composing the lists. Uh, when you need to pass through the list, uh, add some uh, another list to the end of these. When you need to compose even more lists, you need to pass it it again and again and again, and this makes the free monads uh, slow. But short encoded free monads are not this, like, do not work like this. They are much faster. And, okay, the most valuable thing about free monads is that you can easily test your business logic. Uh, in our JustPay work, we implemented a system that I mentioned earlier, IRT. We take our application, our business logic. We track all the steps, all the effectful steps that are happening there. We write them, we write these steps into a file in form of JSON entities. 
And after that, we can uh, replay these steps against the changed business logic. Uh, and we can see the problems if, if, the, change, if the business logic changes wrongly. How we can do it? Writers of the business logic do not know about the internal mechanism. They don't see it. Still, it uh, works on the interpreting level and checks all the effects. Okay. So you get unit testing for free and you can even tweak this, not only for unit testing, but for integration testing and other stuff. Okay. I think that's almost all I wanted to tell you and here are some links to uh, provide you more info. You can follow these links and see us there. And this is all and thank you for your attention. It was tough, right? Okay. Hey, uh, can we just go back to the code slides where there's a two free monads are there? Yeah, let's uh, this. Uh, yes, there's a. All right. So, <coughs> if I say want to deal with the database effect separately, and say the Redis or the key value pair, mm -hmm. there are two kinds of databases, and I want to sort of track them separately. Uh, so I will write a free monad interpreter for the database. Mm -hmm. I will write a free monad interpreter for the for Redis, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I want to write a function where at the type level I want to say, so I want to write say three functions: one which can deal only with the database, one which can deal only with Redis, and one which can deal with both. Mm -hmm. uh, how you can do that? How I can? How can I do that? Okay. Essentially, we have. Uh, different QVDBs in our frameworks. In Hydra, I implemented two of them, uh, Redis and uh, RocksDB. And the idea here is that, right, you're right, that you can have two different interpreters and to call one of them from the business logic, you have a notion of com connection, which is parameterized by a type. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. rephrase my question. I think you misunderstood it. Okay. So uh, I can see app L over there, right? And my understanding up till now is that once some function is in app L, yeah. then it can do any of those effects right. that app L supports right. without changing the type signature. Like if you're re reading a function's type signature and that says app L, then it can uh, access the state, it can access SQL, right. it can access logger, it can do all of those effects. Right. right? Now, if I want to restrict a function, I want it to do some effects, but I want one function to do only SQL and one function to do only logging. Yeah, you can do it with uh, these particular effects. Like you can write uh, business logic inside uh, logger L monad, and then you just pass this logger L to a function like this. It will be logger L here. There is a function for this. They are nested not just by declaring them nested. They are nested by calling functions um, which take scenarios of the underlying la languages. So you can easily write this function separately in this. So logger yeah. L is a separate free monad and yes. SQL DB L is a separate free monad. Right. And app L is composing them. Right. Right. Now if I want to do ad hoc compositions of these effects, is that possible using f this particular library? Right. So app L, it seems to me, combines all of these free monads. Right. But suppose I want to do it that in an ad hoc manner. I have a one function wherein I want to make sure that it can access, it can do only two things, SQL and logging. That will I have be, to write, yeah. like, will that be a, a combinatorial explosion of effects? Will yeah. I have to write? Yeah, that, that's probably possible. Still, you need to write some additional stuff for this. Uh, but, I don't like this approach because why do you need to specify your effects so granular? I, I understand that um, we want to control these effects in particular. Still, it comes to the situation when 
You don't need such behavior in your application. You need some uh, domains of be the behavior, not the effects scattered all over the uh, functions. So, so yeah. When we were doing this, it was like pure script row level effects. You just end up having these types which are polluting your names, your your all your code and your types, and it gives you nothing. Like you don't really gain something by isolating, say, console and log like and network over here and only DB over here. We didn't actually see any gains from that granularity of splitting things up in practice, at least. Maybe other people have had different experiences. And I actually would love to hear about that if that's the case, but we haven't seen it. And it looks like the PureScript community itself did not see the value in that because they dropped those row level effects in 0 or 12 and just moved to something that's like IO. Yeah, at the, yeah so it's only effect now. There's no F of anything. It's, there's just so one. Yeah, it's called effect. It's the same as IO. Yeah, still uh, many hackers don't, will not ag agree with us because, you know, it's, uh, it's a common practice to specify exactly a set of effects for this function and exactly another set of effects for those functions. Still, it makes refactoring really hard. And when you write a lot of t business logic, you don't need to control all these functions in a, their own particular way. Actually, you need to understand uh, arrays of your code, not a particular parts of these arrays. Like this is my uh, KVDB subsystem and all those functions will be work with KVDB. I'll give just one yeah. motiv motivating example for yeah, that, okay. for like having slightly more okay. granular control. Okay is when you're building caching layers. So you would want to write a bunch of functions which can talk only to Redis okay. and not to the DB so that you make sure that they're just picking up stuff from the cache. Just, it's, I've not completely thought about this idea, but the core thing was that in, in the MTL style, it sort of encourages you to have granular, slightly more granular effects. Actually, you can uh, write uh, a free monadic code in an MTL style. Like there are type classes defined for these, all these languages and you can write a business logic uh, with those type classes and they will be uh, using a free monadic inside. Still, I think it's not worth it. Yeah, so, so we actually ran into something like this and it was actually the opposite. We didn't want the calling code to care about whether it's going to the cache or not, right? Because usually what you'd want to do is if you fail at the cache, you hit the DB, right? So this approach helps you not care about that. So you basically want to say, look up this thing, and that look up might hit your cache first and then fall back to the DB. So, so it's actually worse if you have that level of, that kind of split. Is, does anyone else want to ask questions? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Yeah. Um, so how does the performance compare versus MTL? Oh, it's an inter interesting question because I mm, uh, gave another talk, uh, final toggles versus free monad, uh, for which I investigate the performance. And there are several uh, things to consider here. First, when you write some business logic, uh, you can write this business logic inside those monadic languages and then you can compose those functions in, inside APL, and they will have own, uh, own interpreting processes. If that was just a regular free monadic, free monad, then those separate uh, languages should have own common continuation list, and then you can cut them in the app. So in this sense, the, um, the performance should be uh, considered like a sum of the performances in s internal languages. But if we are talking about short encoded free monad, it show, shows uh, the same performance as final tags and the MTL. Literally, I have a graph in which a free monad blows up right, right to the sky and uh, final tagless and church encoded from monads uh, go uh, together uh, linearly. So yeah, it, it can, it, church encoded from monads 
are like final tagless and MTL in sense of performance, which is good. You know, Beam is is using chat encoded frame or not inside. Uh, I would also add that I built STM library using uh, church encoded free monad and uh, just free monad, both in Haskell and C++. And I saw significant improvement, improvement in performance uh, in church encoded part. Yeah, thank you.